Well, good morning, church. Um, my name is Delinda, but um, as we're in the Gospel of John, um, at the end of the Gospel of John is the first time that John identifies himself, and then he doesn't even say his name. The, even after having lived a really full life, the only one of the original apostles who lived a long life who wasn't martyred at a young age was John. And he had racked up a lot of accolades and titles and all he could have by the end of his life. But all he wanted to say about himself, the only title he wanted at the end of the book was, I'm the guy that Jesus loves. And that's the title I want. Isn't that the title that you want? I'm the one that Jesus loves. <laughs> if that's you, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm the one that Jesus loves. So I love the book of John. I love it because, partly because, since he wrote it so late, scholars believe that this was the last of the Gospels that was written, and probably John wrote it at the end of his life when he had had so many years to just meditate on and think about and relive the stories that he had lived through as he walked with Jesus and to understand them in a deeper way. Was, was it that God, God was actually doing there? And that's what we get in the Gospel of John. That's why it's so different than Matthew, Mark, Mark and Luke because we get John's under the direction of the Holy Spirit, his thinking through what did this really mean? So we're in chapter four this time, this week. And in chapter four, starting in verse one, Jesus had been down in Judea and the lower part of the southern part of Israel. And he uh, had begun to gather around him, or people had begun to be sucked right into his wonder and were following him. And he had quite a few disciples by this time and that was making the Pharisees nervous. And so we start off with that. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. The Pharisees were already nervous about John and the disciples he was gathering. And now this guy was gathering even more disciples. Although... John the Apostle, the author of the book, he wants to clarify something here. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So again, one of those eyewitness little bits here that cause us to see John was right there and he wanted to set the record straight. It was we disciples who were doing the baptizing, just so you know. Um, so the thing is, that still to this day, disciples are baptizing in that same place. So we've got a picture of what it looks like down at the River Jordan. This is a scene from the sky of the River Jordan. And to this day, disciples are still baptizing people there. And we've got a picture of that. Here's some disciples that were being baptized and baptizing just even last summer. I think you might recognize those people. <laughs> oh, yeah. So disciples still following Jesus, still baptizing in the Jordan River. But the question, of course, is um, that that brings to mind is why wasn't Jesus doing the baptizing? When we come across these kind of things in scripture where you read it and you suddenly go, hmm, what's that all about? It's a good place to stop and to do some research and to think about it and see if you can figure out why is that little thing happening? Why wasn't Jesus doing the baptizing? And we can find a hint about that if we look back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke um, and where it talks about when John the Baptist was talking about this baptizing thing. The Pharisees had asked him, who are you and why are you doing this baptizing? Who gave you this authority? Are you the Messiah? And he replied, no, I'm not the Messiah, but this is what he said as it's recorded in Mark chapter one. And this was his, John the Baptist's, John the baptizer's message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now it's hard for us, for human beings who live in an earthly setting, it's hard for us to understand spiritual things 
because we live such an earthly life. And so much of what we see and read and much of what Jesus did and showed us is done with symbols and with metaphors and with parables and with stories that help us to understand what's going on in the spiritual realm. We baptize with water. We baptize, and John the baptizer baptized as a symbol of sins being washed away and starting over new and clean. But we know that water can't really do that. It's just a symbol of it. The same thing when we're baptized here. It's a symbol of that, washing away of sins. It's also a symbol of what we learned last week in chapter 3 when Jesus talks to Nicodemus and says, you must be born again. It's a symbol of that being born again. It's a symbol of being buried and rising up into new life. But it's a symbol. But Jesus, John tells us, baptizes with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not a symbol, it's the real thing. The Holy Spirit is real. And when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is within us, gives us new life, leads us into the truth, helps us then to have the ability to follow Jesus the way. The Holy Spirit is a real thing. And that, a real person. And that's what this story is about largely one of the fo many focuses of this story in chapter 4. And so because of that um, worry with the Pharisees, most likely, we go on in verse 3 of John 4. So he left Judea in the southern part of Israel and went w back once more to Galilee, which is up in the north. Now he had to go through Samaria, which was a piece of land right in between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north, where the people who lived there were people that were a mixture of Jews who had intermarried with um, back years and years and years ago with people from other nations and their religion was partly Jewish and partly an uh, accumulation of other, it was fuzzy. It was fuzzy Judaism is what it was, and that's where he had to go through. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, or maybe Sychar, I don't really know. I wouldn't know if I was, spoke Hebrew, but I don't. Near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Now I want to take, even though there's so much to cover here um, today, but I do want to take just a little minute and talk about the strategic intentionalization of Jesus showing up and this story happening in this particular place. Because long years ago, we know that God created a perfect world, a perfect kingdom, and called his people that he created, his human beings, to rule and to reign over that land but he's over his creation but he said there's only one thing you need to be sure and do you need to get to learn how to rule and reign from me you need to learn what is right and what is wrong from me but we know that the original human being said nope I think I've got a better idea and so they wanted to do it their own way and sadly we have been making that same decision ever since then no I'd rather be in charge I'd rather rule it my way and so creation was broken. But God has never given up on his kingdom, ever. He continues, continues to redeem and to bring people into his true kingdom. And so he called a man named Abram and he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to send you to a strategic place where you can build, where I will build a nation and you will display and show what it's like to be people who live in the kingdom of God. And so here's a map that shows, you know, I would have to do some maps. I'm a map nerd. I re really, I am. Um, here's Here's a map that shows where Abraham, how Abraham traveled um, through the land of Israel. It's that dark line. And when he got right about into the middle there, to the middle between the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee at the top, and the Dead Sea at the bottom, he stopped at a place called Shechem. And in that place was one of many places where God spoke to him and he said, God spoke to Abraham and said, I'm going to give you this land. 
And so Abram built an altar there and worshiped God at that place. Now at that place, there are two hills. Jeru uh, Israel is very hilly. And the hills are, they call them mountains, but that's because they don't live in the Pacific Northwest and know what a real mountain is. But the hills that they call mountains are very much like the hills that surround us. And in this place at Shechem, there are two hills that are quite close together. One is called Mount Gerizim, one is called Mount Ebal, right in that place. Keep that in mind. So then, after Abram left that place where he worshipped God, he traveled again up and down throughout the land, bought a plot of it in order to bury his wife, Sarah, that what has remained as part of their family. And then his son, Isaac, also traveled through the land. His grandson, Jacob, traveled through the land too, came to that pl same place in Shechem, and also built an altar there and worshipped God. And in that place, he bought a plot of land and he dug a, a, a well there. He bought it from the people who were living there. And he dug a well there, which is called Jacob's Well, of course. And we've got a picture of what Jacob's Well looked like in 1912. Here are the ruins of it. And in the background, you can see Mount Gerizim there. Nowadays, there's a huge temple, a huge church, Greek Orthodox church, that's built over that place where the ruins of Jacob's well uh, are. And you can go now to, the, at, at this very day, you can go and see Jacob's well. And it's more than 100 feet deep, about 135 feet deep. So that's the land that we're talking about. Now, it's so important Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and this well right in between the two of them is so strategic, incredibly strategic, because years later when Moses was leading now what had become more than three million people out of slavery in Egypt and heading them back to this land where God said, now you are the great nation I promised Abram and so I'm gonna take you back to the land that I promised you. And God spoke to Moses and he said, when they get to this land, you are to send leaders up to the top of Mount Gerizim and gather all of those people, three million plus people, at the base of that hill and you are to have these leaders proclaim what the kingdom of God is like. This is what it's like to belong to, the, to God the king. The blessings that come from that. And then you're to send six other leaders to the top of Mount Ebal, and they are to proclaim loudly so everybody can hear, this is what it's like if you continue in the kingdom of darkness if you continue in the kingdom that rejects God as king. And this is the opportunity for those people, for the people of God to choose. Do they want to be in the kingdom of God? Do they want to continue in the kingdom of darkness? And when Joshua finally led, who came after Moses as leader, finally led them into the land, that's exactly what they did. From Mount Gerizim was proclaimed, this is what it's like to be God's people in his kingdom. And from Mount Ebal, this is what it's like if you continue to go your own way. And Joshua said, choose, choose. As for me and my household, Joshua said, we choose life. But today, choose. So that choice was given and continues to be given to the people of Israel, continues to be given to us. And if we look at the next map, well, actually, two maps. Yeah, skip one because I skipped. This is, thank you, Brock, sorry. <laughs> Whoever is trying to keep up with me on slides. This, the reason that I said it's so important for us to know this now is because, I believe, is because this is a map of Israel now and where this whole place was taken care of, where Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and Jacob's well and this valley of decision, where that is, is right in the middle of the West Bank. And we hear that on the news every single day now. And we see the conflict that's going on in that place. 
And there's been conflict going on in that place forever. This is not new. As there is conflict that goes on in our own hearts and lives, are we going to be part of God's kingdom? Are we going to continue to make ourselves the kings and queens of our own life in the kingdom of darkness? The question, of course, is what's the way? What's the way there? How do you get in? And that's the point of this whole series, the way. So we're going to take a look now at Jesus as this continues. What is the way? How do you get to that kingdom? So continuing the story on verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Again, another eyewitness account there from John. The Samaritan woman said to him, <clears throat> You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? John explains here, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Again, it was that you guys are lesser than we are. You don't follow the true Jewish laws. You're a hybrid of people from other nations. We don't even want to drink out of the same vessel as you do. Unless we get all high and mighty about that, it wasn't that long ago in our nation. I remember it. I was a child when the laws of our nation said some people can't drink out of the same water fountains as other people. We are no better. We are absolutely no better. But Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus comes up with these mind-blowing metaphors. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But everyone who drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welding up to eternal life. And John, as I said before, had a lifetime of um, being able to think about these metaphors and what did they really mean. And so he explains it a couple chapters later in John 7, starting in verse 37. Jesus and his disciples were down again at Jerusalem at a festival. And on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And now John explains it. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. But John the Apostle was writing this at the end of his life, after he had already experienced the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And that's why John was able to say the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out yet, but it has been poured out now. And so those rivers of living water are available to us right now. And it's a real thing. It's not a symbol of anything. The Holy Spirit fills us up as we give our lives to Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability then to follow Jesus, who is the way. But at this point, with this woman, she's still trying to figure it out. And so we go on in John chapter 4, verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water. She just still doesn't get it. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. Now, where is he headed with it? She asks a perfectly reasonable question, and he says, go call your husband. And she and I, I can feel this. I can feel, I can feel her heart with this. 
She says, I have no husband. She replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now I can just imagine this woman. It's a painful thing to be a woman without a husband. Even in this day and age, it's a painful thing to be a woman without a husband. And she couldn't even bring herself to say anything more than that, especially not to a stranger. But Jesus knew. He knew. He knew what was too hard for her to say. He knew it. Now, it's easy for us. In fact, you've probably heard sermons about this. This is the way we normally think of why that was. What was this deal with these five husbands, and now she's living with somebody she's not even married to? And so we immediately feel like this woman has got relationship issues. This woman is promiscuous. She has jumped from husband to husband to husband, and now she's living with a guy. She's a sinner. She just is a, an immoral woman. But it was eye-opening to me when I heard about a group of women in Nigeria whom their missionary named Charles Kraft, who is a professor at Fuller Seminary, asked a group of Nigerian women, why was this woman at the well in the middle of the day when it was so hot? Because women normally go to the well early in the morning when it's cool. Why was she there all by herself in the middle of the day? And these Nigerian women knew immediately what they thought she was there for, why? She, they said, well, it's because she was barren and she couldn't have children. Because it was too painful to go to, for her to go to the well in the early morning when the other women were there with their babies on their backs and they were talking about their babies and their families and raising the children and it was just too hard for this woman to be there at that time when she was not able to have children. Now, it makes a lot of sense to me, actually, the Nigerian version of this, their backstory based on their own experiences. We always read the Bible from our own perspective, our own experiences, and we create our own backstory. The Bible doesn't say why she was there. But it's true, and Nigerians knew this, no woman would ever divorce a man. In those days, they just didn't do that. They couldn't even do the divorcing. Only men could divorce. And a man, a man wanted a woman who could bear him a son and bear him children to continue the work. And so five men had divorced her and sent her away because she was not able to fulfill what they were looking for in a wife. And now she's living with a man who perhaps was just caring for her. We don't know. We don't know the backstory. But the question is, for us, to Jesus, did it matter that this woman was a sinner or that she was a broken-hearted, abandoned woman? He didn't condemn her either way. But he knew her. And then he goes on, and she begins to see this is unusual. And the sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, Gerizim, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, that the Messiah is coming from the tribe of Judah. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And the woman replies, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us and wait for it. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. 
What a mic drop moment. <laughs> We don't know how to we don't know how to worship properly. We don't know where to go to worship. We're thirsty and we're hungry and we don't know what to do and we're lost. And Jesus comes and speaks right into that and says, "I know. I know all about your story. I know the places where you have messed up and your troubles are your own fault. I know that." I also know the places when your life where you have somebody else's poor decisions have affected your life. I know the places where just your life is just not what you really thought it was going to be. I know all of that. And I am the Messiah. I am the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the one. What you stand in this place right here with the choice of am I going to go into God's kingdom and be a part of his kingdom following this one who knows all about me and doesn't condemn me but offers me life or am I going to continue to walk in darkness this direction. This place of decision where this woman was was very strategically planned for God by Jesus for this woman and also for us. He has the living water, the Holy Spirit that gives us life and he offers it to us. But we stand in the place of decision. He will never force it on us. He knows how we got to where we are and he does not condemn us he came to bring life, not condemnation. We are already are in the kingdom of darkness, and he offers us life. Now, this is a I made this decision long years ago when I was 18 years old, but on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I need to remember that I belong to the kingdom of God. It's a continual reminding that I belong to the kingdom of God and Jesus is the one I follow. He is the way. Because we live in a place where they're, they're, this conflict is going on continually and it's a decision that we make daily. Jesus, I'm following you. So we're going to take just a moment and we're just going to look right at the the heart and the eyes of this one who knows everything about us and doesn't condemn us but calls us into his kingdom and for some here it might be the very first time that you have ever said yes Jesus I want to decide for the kingdom I want to decide for you I want to follow you you are the way for others like me it's Jesus again I just recommit myself to you I belong to you and I want no other Let's just take a moment and look at Jesus. And if this is the first time that you have ever made that decision and said, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want your life. I want your living water. I want to be in your kingdom. I want to be a child of God. If it's the first time, please be bold enough just to raise your hand so that we can say yes, thank you, so that we can pray with you and say yes. Jesus. Thank you for the life that you give us. Thank you for your spirit that you pour out on us. You give us the ability to follow you as you lead us to how to be the people of God. Thank you for that, Lord. We worship you. We give you glory and honor. Our hearts are yours, Lord Jesus. May you be glorified in them. And we pray this all together in Jesus' name. Well, before 
before you go, let me remind you of just some of the opportunities that we have to be the people of God together here. One is a women's meeting that's happening today after, after this service. As soon as we're done here, the women's meeting is meeting today. Uh, Wednesday night starts the Way Bible Study and Fellowship this Wednesday in this very room at 6 p.m. And then February 11th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, we're having a Super Sunday celebration here with Super to watch the Super Bowl. And if you want to find out any more information about any of that, out in the Connect counter out there is more information. If you would like anybody to pray with you, if you have anything that you want someone to join you in prayer with, there will be prayer, uh, there will be people here ready and willing to pray with you. So just as other people are leaving, just come on down and we will pray with you with for whatever it is that you would like help prayer with. Okay? All right. God bless you. Go and be blessed. Bye.